life. But uh, today we're going to be looking at the resurrection. What you need to understand as we go into it, Corinth isn't very far from Athens. As a matter of fact, it's, you know, one day's journey, you could, less than a day's journey, people from Corinth could get down to Athens. So a lot of the same cultural aspects that they had in Athens, they also had in Corinth. They were very much into philosophy. And although um, Gnosticism had not set in yet, I think the roots of Gnosticism were already growing. Gnosticism meaning that people believed that knowledge was everything. You know, that uh, it was only through knowledge that you could really be who you were going to be. Almost sounds like the army, right? Uh, be all that you want. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so um, the thing is, though, that when people started thinking that way and they started thinking philosophically and they started thinking about logic, how, how does logic play in and whatnot? If you go back to Acts 17 and look from verses 16 on through the end of the chapter, that's where Paul went to Athens. Remember that? Then they took him to the Areopagus. Areopagus was like this real big rock, you know, on, on, uh, in, in Athens. And you could go up on it and you could see all over Athens. Well, he went up there. And earlier he had talked to them about the resurrection. But in this case, I'm sure you've heard the story about uh, that he had seen a lot of different uh, monuments to all these different gods, idols, right? And he told them, I see that you guys are a very religious people, but I want to talk to you about this one that you have to the unknown God. Remember, he was talking about that. So he used that as a segue to tell them about the good news. Well, if you remember, the real hang-up with some of them was when he got to the part of the resurrection. Some, some of the people there wanted to hear more. But what you found was that many of them just, that's something they couldn't wrap their head around. Resurrection was just too far out. It was something that just didn't even fit within the realm of discourse, to, according to them. And so they just said, this is too hard to believe. And so they just said, basically, I'm out of here. Well, a lot of that same mindset was also permeating the church at Corinth. And it's because, see, the problem with the Corinthians is that they just were too used to the whole issue of the culture they were in. And they had issues the same as the folks in Athens, because they, they, were, they wanted still to be a part of what was going on. And I mean, I'm not saying it's kind of like what Jesus was talking about in John chapter 17 when he was talking. I mean, the main message in that chapter is basically be in the world, but not of the world. And see, the problem with the Corinthians was they wanted to be in the world and they wanted to be part of the world and then add Jesus to it, you know, wherever he fit in. Well, to do that, though, there were many of those in the Church of Corinth that didn't believe in the resurrection. They just basically said, that blows my mind. It's too far out there. That's not something I even want to really grasp. And so Paul has to, once again, exhort them and provide them some instruction about the resurrection. So any questions on that intro before we pray? Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together to study your word. We praise you that your word is truth and that it is perfect revelation, special revelation that you've given us that allows us to be able to understand you and what you have provided for us. Now, Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts and minds and let your Holy Spirit work so that we can understand what it is that you want to tell us today, and also to put it into practice in a way that brings you honor and glory. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, let's go ahead and jump in. Now, chapter 15 is a long chapter. So obviously, you know, this was a topic that Paul really felt was important and needed some serious attention. 
So in the process, he made sure that he covered all the bases as he's going with this thing. So he says in chapter 15, verse 1 and following, it says, now I would remind you, brothers, meaning that he's already talked to him about this, that this isn't something new. This isn't something he's just bringing out of the blue, but it is something that he's already talked to him about. And so he says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So what he's doing is he's just making clear to them that the good news that he presented at the beginning hasn't changed. It was still the same good news then when he basically planted the church, and it wasn't any different than it is today. So he's setting the groundwork here to say, look, you need to get back to the basics that I taught you. Obviously, you've gone off the rails somewhere, and you need to get your focus back on Christ. You need to get your focus back on God. You need to get your focus back on what it is that the good news is all about. It's not about something that changes. It's, it's about something that is fixed. So, uh, in other words, you can't expect the Word of God to be something that's shifting, like shifting sands, but it is something that we can trust, and it's going to be the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, that's where he set the groundwork to this topic about the problems that they were having in terms of believing some of the fundamentals about Jesus Christ. And We've talked about this before, that there are certain basic truths that all Christians have to abide by. You know, I mean, they are, those, those things are not things that you can argue about and say, well, I don't see that it's this way. But they are given constants that are central to salvation. They are given constants that are central to what Jesus has done and what the Father has done through his Son. And if you don't have those fundamentals in place, then you're not a Christian. You can say you're a Christian all you want, but if you haven't come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and into a daily relationship with him, a growing relationship with a hunger and a desire to glorify God, then that's where you fall into that realm where Paul says, then you better check your salvation out with fear and trembling. Because there are certain factors that are what salvation is all about. And if you, can't, if you can't come to grips with those, then you've got a problem in believing at all. Because, I mean, there are many, you'd be surprised how many Christians out there say, oh, no, Christianity, yeah, I'm a Christian. But when you really start asking them about the fundamentals, about how they came to know Jesus Christ, and what does Jesus Christ mean in their lives today, What's their testimony? What can they tell you? I mean, basically, they can't get beyond, well, I'm a good person, and I attend church at least twice a month, you know, so they feel in that respect that they're a good enough Christian. In other words, it's all about self. There's really no dependence on Christ in it, other than the fact that they've just labeled themselves as a Christian, and those are difficult situations to get into because they think that they're okay. They think that they're fine. And as far as they're concerned, they think they're going to heaven if they die. But the reality is they haven't really come into a relationship with Jesus Christ yet. Well, that's what's happening to our folks here in Corinth, is that they unfortunately have wandered away from some of the fundamental issues about salvation. And Paul needs to get them straightened out about the, this issue. So, he says in verse 3, oh, by the way, hello, Martin. How you doing, brother? I think he's uh, there. Hi, sir. How are you? Doing well, my brother. Doing well. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Amen. So look what he says in verse 3. For I delivered to you as a first importance, in other words, fundamental stuff, okay, about the good news, as a first importance, what I also received. In other words, God revealed this to him through Jesus Christ. He says that I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, 
and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to twelve, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, could go back to Acts and look at that, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Now you say, why? And then he says, last, last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So you say, why, why is it important? I mean, obviously he makes his point there in verse four, right? He says, well, in verse three and four, he says, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with scriptures. That's fundamental. That stipulates what the Son did in accordance with the Father's will to be able to provide the propitiation, the payment for sin. Okay, that was, and that was the only satisfying action that the Father would accept is that the son would have to go do these things. And that's why when Jesus was here on his ministry, especially, well, obviously in his last three and a half years that we read about in the gospels, anytime anyone asked him, you know, about what he was doing, he would always respond, you know, I'm here to do the will of my father. And that that was more important to him than anything else. So, that's what he was doing, was he was showing what it was that Christ had done that was so important. It looks like somebody's sending me a chat, but for some reason I used to be able to see it. Now I can't see it. Let me see if I do this. Oh, Cephas. Um, Cephas was Peter. In other words, Simon Peter, the apostle, that he was also, Cephas is his, was that his uh, um, a Greek name? No, Cephas was uh, his Hebrew name, right? You're the one to walk on water? I think it's his Hebrew name. Yeah, it's his Hebrew name. That's what it was. Cephas is his Hebrew name. So, yeah, it's Peter. That's who, that's who Cephas is. Yeah, I because think it's Peter, it's Peter, Peter is the Greek. rock. Greek. Uh, okay, well, well, because we had Simon. Remember, he was Simon. Then Jesus named him Peter, right? He went by... But Cephas and Simon, I know, were interchangeable. But you don't see it much, but you hear mostly in Acts is where you see him talking about Cephas. So, yeah. Anyway. It actually, it actually when I looked it up in the Strongs, it yeah. said um, it's another name for the Apostle Peter, and it means the rock. Hmm. So, anyway, oh. Cephas is rock. Well, then so. that's what Jesus gave him. That's the name Jesus gave him there. Mm -hmm. Except for when he was mad at him, and then he called him Simon. That's that was him. Yep. Yeah. Whenever it seemed like there was an issue, all of a sudden he'd he be Peter. Simon he again. The yeah. rock. He was Simon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What, what did he call him when he walked on water? Like when your parents call you by your first and your middle name, you know you're in deep, yep. deep, 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 deep trouble. trouble. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, as far as I know, he just said "come" when he said "walk on the water." Because remember, Peter had asked him. He says, uh, "You know, just call me, or that I may come." And Jesus said, mm -hmm. "Come." Mm -hmm. That's all he said. And and Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water. And yeah, you're right there, Victor. Mm -hmm. So, so at what? That's why what we're looking at here is is so important. Um, is because I mean, even today. Think how many different denominations or different types of churches out there that claim Christianity, but there are certain fundamentals that they won't accept, that they won't live by, um, that the Bible clearly says you must, if you want to receive salvation, there is salvation in no other name than in the name of Jesus. And then the gospel is about all of what Jesus came to do, why he came here to earth. Why did he spend time with people? Why was he here? And when you understand his mission and what the Father's mission was through him, then you start understanding his, the fundamentals of what we believe and why we believe it. Because it was God's you know, selfless love that prompted him to do what he did. Because, I mean, for all intents and purposes, don't you think, mankind deserve exactly what we got back in Noah's day with the flood? 
I mean, when you think about it, I mean, we still deserve that today. But, okay. but yeah. God said he wasn't going to destroy the world with a flood, and he wasn't going to eradicate mankind again that way. So, so the issue is, you know, God had a different plan then. Because, I mean, if you're not going to just clean, clean house every time you need to clean house, then you've got to have another plan, right? And God's plan was, well, in that case then, I've got to do something to redeem mankind because man's heart is naturally evil in all things. That's just man. And so he says, what can I do then to overcome this condition that man has? And that's when God made the plan, you know, and we see it throughout the Old Testament prophesied that Jesus, basically that God would come and he would be the solution through G and we know it now because it was through Jesus Christ that he carried out that plan so that we all can be forgiven of our sin but the only way you can get be forgiven is you have to come into relationship with him to take advantage of what he did on the cross you have to accept that Christ did die for our sins in accordance with scriptures that he was buried and that he was there for three days and that he was raised on the third day, right? And that he was raised. So there has to be a resurrection in accordance with the scriptures. If you can't believe that, then you've got a trouble, then you've got a problem coming into relationship with Jesus Christ, because those are fundamentals that you have to accept, and God gives you the saving faith to accept those fundamentals when you come into relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, a lot of times, if you just try to accept them in and of your own strength, and your own logic, or if you're a scientist and you say, no, nah, people just don't come to life like that again. No, nah, that's, uh, so I can't accept that. Well, then you're going to have a problem believing in Jesus Christ, period. So, and that God did what he said he did. And these are supernatural events. These aren't scientific events that you're going to say, well, it's theoretical, or it's something that I can prove or I can disprove. It's something that God did in and through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's and he then has become the only way to salvation, period. There's no other discussion. If any of those points don't work in terms of what you can come to grips with, then you can't take advantage of why Jesus came to do that. Because, I mean, it's in the believing, you know, doesn't Hebrews eleven six say that even without faith, it's impossible to please him? There has to be a level of acceptance that says God is all powerful. He can do whatever he pleases when he pleases. He is sovereign. And when you accept that, then, you, you, then you're into the realm of saying what God, God has done, what he intended to do, and praise God that he did it, because if he hadn't done it, where would I be today? And basically, we'd be in, in the realm of whatever is going to happen to somebody that has no future. And for us, I mean, think about that. Either you believe that there's eternity after life, or you don't. It doesn't change the fact that the eternity is there. But some people just believe, no, when I die, you know, I just kind of like the Buddhist and some of the far eastern religions believe that once you pass away your energy just gets contributed to the universe and so your energy is out there. and in some cases some people believe that that energy can come back and be reconstituted you know or <laughs> reincarnated as it were but those are pie in the sky beliefs there is no fundamental proof that says that it could be so they need faith even to believe that then don't they because, I mean, yeah. there's no way of proving it, but yet, you know, some of them believe that way. Well, but they, we have Christ's revealed word in the Bible. And so that's what Paul is trying to tell the Corinthians here. I was revealed this information by God directly, and that's what I shared with you, the good news. And now we have it today because it's, it's written and it's available to us today. So... Let's, let's move back into the scripture and take a look at what he's saying here. He says, oh, wait, was the, I think there was a chat thing there. Oh, yeah. 
Don, I thought Jesus coming and crucified was planned before the foundation of the earth. That's correct. Donna is correct. I mean, if I, I don't know what I implied in there, but if I implied that it was only in the Old Testament, no. Well, it wasn't, I mean, God planned, God had all his plans made out before creation. Okay, so yes, don't think that, you know, it all happened after the flood or something that says, oh, well, it was only after God finally got fed up with man that he decided to make plans. No, his plans were, have, uh, mm. have always been. As, as yeah. Don, Don is correct. Yeah, Mark. Okay. And I would say from the beginning, man was made capable of sinning. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, we wouldn't have sinned. Right, right. I mean, if we weren't capable of sinning, why would God have allowed Satan to talk to Eve? There well, would have been if, no that have been the, if that wouldn't have been the case, uh, obviously, uh, uh, Eve would not have eaten of the apple because they were incapable. Exactly. Obviously, God made men capable of sin. Yep. And again, it just, it just basically to, uh, to support the foundation that, yes, since the beginning, have, God had planned to send uh, Jesus as, uh, to die on the cross. Amen. Amen. So, yeah, both you and Donna are correct. God always had a plan. You know, sometimes you hear people say, oh, well, that God had to kind of back up and punt when Eve sinned. No, he didn't. God already had the plan in place. It's not like God all of a sudden said, oh, wait, oh, man, I didn't, I didn't see that one coming. You know? No. Uh -oh. God... <laughs> exactly. Stage two. Yeah. So, because God already had his plan in place. He already knew what was coming. So, yes. So what Donna and Martin have said, yeah, are correct. Um, and, and Donna's right. He says, according to ha how he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Um, Ephesians 1.4. So, uh, I mean, God already had a plan. So don't think that there wasn't a plan already. But God has revealed his ongoing plan in different ways at different stages throughout history as we know it but it was always pointing toward what he was going to do through his son jesus christ on the mm -hmm. cross and we know that today because that's the gospel john i mean that paul's talking about here this is the gospel that says that based in accordance with the scriptures christ died for our sins and that he was buried and he was raised on the third day okay and then he justifies that paul justifies it by saying look these are all people that are still with us today. And look, they saw Jesus after he had risen from the dead. And so that's why he names all these different people, even himself, you know. And he says, last of all, an untimely born, he appeared also to me. In other words, he's saying, look, because Paul always cut himself down big time for, because of the fact that he says, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm worse than anybody because I killed believers in Jesus Christ. And for all intents and purposes, I was killing the body of Christ. So I'm worse than all those, but God showed incredible mercy and grace because he appeared to me and I was untimely born. In other words, I wasn't born to join in with the 12 when the 12 were around, but he's saying I'm untimely because to me it happened after Jesus had already ascended. So he was out of place in the sense that he experienced Jesus, but he wasn't with Jesus here on this earth. You know what I'm saying? That's why he puts himself as untimely born and out of place, but yet with the same level of calling as the initial apostles were called. And so, and then he says, he appeared to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to become an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. So he really, he always saw himself as you know, in, in a bad position just by virtue of the fact that he was killing Christians. And so, but he look what he says in verse 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. In other words, I was more motivated than anybody else to go out and proclaim the good news because of what Christ did for me. 
basically he took me out of my bondage and even though i was more zealous than all of them i wanted to show myself to be you know following god as a pharisee he thought he really was he thought what he was doing was right not until jesus got his attention right, right. Yep. <laughs> all of a sudden he realized man i've been doing what was wrong all along and so jesus got him straightened out so that was the grace he's talking about that he received and that because he received that grace he has become more motivated than probably all the others to go out and share the good news he said on the contrary i worked harder than any of them though it was not i but the grace of god that is with me so in other words i mean he's giving credit where credit's due you know it wasn't him through his own works that he's talking about he's saying that god's grace through him giving him strength through the holy spirit is what allowed him to go out and be as effective in carrying out the good news to the Gentiles, well, to the Jews and the Gentiles. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. He says, whether it was they, they he's usually referring to those, the other apostles, okay? So he's talking about the 11. Uh, that's where he's saying, or they, but it also can mean the people that have that came in after he established the church. Remember toward the beginning, I said that um, uh, one of the pastors that they had after Paul had planted the church was, man, his name just slipped my mind. What was the name of the Egyptian Christian that was very articulate, starts with an A? Artemis. What? Artemis? No, not, oh man, come on, Ted. The mm -hmm. one that came and he was preaching uh, uh, the baptism of John. Uh, about Apollos? Uh, Apollos, yeah, Apollos. Yeah. And so, remember, Apollos became a pastor at Corinth after Paul left. Okay? So, he can be referring to they, because also, remember, Timothy came, and some of the others, when you read the scriptures, you find that others had showed up in Corinth to actually teach and help out. So he can be referring to them too. What he's talking about is they here at Corinth have had people sharing the good news with them all along. And the issue is now they've run into a problem because they're starting to believe things. They're trying to mix world beliefs with Christian beliefs. And that's not going to work. And so that's where Paul is having an issue with them at this point in time. And we see that even today in the churches today. A lot of times churches water down things because they want to make it more palatable to the people. You know, it's, I know we use this a lot, but hey, it's biblical. It's that itching ears thing that certain churches really want. They want something that just makes them feel warm and fuzzy, but don't make me feel convicted or, you know, feel like a sinner for heaven's sakes, you know, make me feel good and happy and that everything's going to turn out well, you know, I mean, that's that kind of philosophy that has permeated many churches and many ways Christians believe today. Because it's, we, we can watch funny, it's funny you bring that up, Ted, because today I was uh, driving, coming back home from Home Depot, uh, making yet another run for something that I had forgotten. But anyway, I'm, I'm coming home and uh, I'm thinking about that, about the messages that churches are putting out there today how it's just all hearts and love and flowers and Jesus is just a good guy and he loves everybody and he loves you, which is true. Mm -hmm. But I, I was thinking, and it's kind of like we all have a disease and it's called sin and we periodically have to take medicine for it. And if we don't, we'll die. Mm -hmm. And medicine never tastes good. <laughs> Rarely have I ever had a medicine that, that tasted good. Even when they try to make it taste good, like Bubble putting gum. cherry or strawberry in it. <laughs> and, that medicine for repentance. <laughs> there you go. But, but you still have to take your medicine. And, and, the, and the trouble is churches aren't giving out doses of medicine today. They're giving out candy. It's like you go to the doctor and afterwards you get candy. Well, <laughs> it's like you go to the doctor and says, you know, you don't need the medicine. Here, take the candy and you'll be good. Yeah, it's like a it's cancer patient going in and, and he says, oh, let me give you a blanket and a candy bar. 
and <laughs> keep it comfortable. And meanwhile, this cancer needs to be cut out. <laughs> exactly. And it's so many churches are like that today. And it's, it's like I, I heard a guy say one time, Jesus, God is still in heaven. Jesus is still Lord. Sin is still sin. And hell is still hot. It is. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> You know, and, and, and that's the basic tenets and, and churches just, they, they don't want to offend anybody because they're afraid that they and their wallet will go with them. That's, that's, a, I mean, it's sad that that's what we've come to in Christianity in many churches today, you know, yeah. but, but it's no different here. It's no different than what Paul's talking about right here to the Corinth church. They, they're trying to basically mix and match whatever they want so that they can feel like they're still accepted by their brothers outside, you know, and their brothers inside the church. See, they're trying to say, I just want to be accepted by everybody. So, hey, I'll just, you know, believe what I want to believe as it fits to be able to make me a part of these groups of people that I want to be part of. And that's what happens when we start wanting to satisfy ourselves and we take our eyes off the Lord and stop thinking about, hey, I need to be giving honor and glory to God and satisfying him. He is most important in my relationship, not other people, not other, you know, ways of life, but he is. And then he gives me what I need to be able to reflect to others. And his love is what should be shining through me. And that's a problem that we have because you're right. You're right, Aaron. Uh, I'm sorry, Andy and uh, Donna. We, we run into those problems because people don't want to address the real core issue, which is sin, which is the fact that, you know, sin does not please God. It grieves the spirit, as a matter of fact, is what the Bible says. And okay. that's not what we want. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, th this is the, uh, the ascension that... The you know, like Andy said, that's not being taught in church because that's a, that's a, 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 a pure good gospel today. But, you know, going back to the resurrection, you know, if we, if we don't believe that, uh, why am I wasting my time? <laughs> why are we wasting our time? Because to be honest with you, if Christ did not, did not raise on the third day, what's going to guarantee that, you know, on the last day, I'm, I'm going to be also resurrected. But see, these are, these are our essentials that we need to grasp. Amen. Because when the time comes, that is for me to die, you know what? I got hope. Amen. Because God is faithful and he's going to keep his promise. Amen. Exactly. And I mean, these are real tenets that you need to accept. And the question is, who do we want to satisfy? Do we want to satisfy self or do we want to satisfy and glorify God? If we've got a problem with just wanting to satisfy self to make ourselves more comfortable. And so we'll set aside any of those fundamental tenets. Then we've got a problem that needs addressing. And that's what Paul's trying to bring up here. I mean, as a matter of fact, in the way Martin put it, I mean, Paul brings it out in a little while. He says, we are most to be, you know, pitied if we're not the ones, if we don't believe in the resurrection. And he's right. Because the issue is then what are we, what are we hanging our hats on? If we can't believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, then we've got nothing to hang our hats on. We're just out there, you know, basically carrying out an exercise in futility. That's what it all comes down to. So, I mean, it is essential. And we see God's hand in it and his plan when we accept the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead. That resurrection is essential. So let's look at what, <coughs> excuse me, let's look at what he says then about the resurrection of the dead. In verse 12, he says, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Like Martin said, if you say there's no resurrection from the dead, then where's our hope? I mean, uh, we have no hope yeah. for all intents and purposes. For, uh, basically, what they're saying, if there's no resurrection from the dead, then we die, and as they say, then you just dead as a stone. You know, I mean, you're done. <laughs> there is nothing after, if that were the fact, right? 
And that's not what the Bible says. So he says, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, look at what he says, then not even Christ has been raised, right? And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. In other words, we've been wasting our times. Our time, it means nothing because we're just out here, you know, running our yaps about something that can't be. But the thing is, is that he's saying, you know, he's basically just contrasting here. He's saying, if, if we were to go down the path that many of you have already elected to go down, saying that resurrection can't happen, then for all intents and purposes, then why are we wasting our time? We got nothing to waste our time about. We might as well just give it up and say, forget it. There's nothing in it. But that's the problem that he's trying to address here, is that it is not a vain hope that we have but we have a substantiated promise. And as he said out of here, up here, look at all of the witnesses that we have. And Donna had put up in there that out of the mouth are two or three witnesses, a matter is established. That goes all the way back to the law, okay? And Paul fulfilled the Torah by mentioning these names. In other words, he's saying there is proof that Jesus resurrected from the dead. This isn't just here pie in the sky stuff that somebody's trying to fabricate fabricate some new religion out there, but he's actually bringing in the truth of what God did through his son, Jesus Christ. And resurrection was part of it. Yes, he died. He was buried, but he also resurrected. And he resurrected in glory and in honor to the glory of God the Father. And it's in what he did and the fact that he resurrected and sits at the right hand. Remember, that's what we studied in the previous chapter about him sitting at the right hand of the throne of God as our high priest. I mean, that's what he's doing. I mean, he couldn't be doing that if he was still dead. So he's alive. Also, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Also, Ted, yeah. you know, grasping this truth will prevent someone that called himself Christian to become an apostate. Amen. As you know, I mentioned before, Oprah Winfield now says that Christ is not the only way. Right. Because she has been drinking the Kool-Aid of the New Age movement. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I, I wonder what was that she spent her time studying all this year. Obviously, right. it was not probably the Bible. Amen. And th those are real things. I mean, the world... Hey, Satan's got subtle things out there to try to pull us away from following Christ today. And Oprah Winfrey is one of them. Look how many followers Oprah Winfrey has. And it's not just Oprah Winfrey. Hey, there's a lot of them out there. But look at how many people hang on everything that she says. And if she says it, oh, well, it must be right. I mean, it's Oprah Winfrey after all. But it's like, well, where does God play out in that? Is Oprah Winfrey somehow equal with God or above God? Come on, people. You know, so it's easy to get wrapped up in the things of the world and get distracted by those in the world, just like what's happening here in Corinth. It happens today. Good example was what Martin just provided with Oprah Winfrey, right? We can easily get distracted on what is not biblical because, well, somebody said it. And that's not what we should be called to. We need to keep our eyes on the Lord. And that's what Paul's trying to do to the Corinthians, is get them back to get their eyes on the Lord and get it back off of the world. Because they wanted to be accepted by the world, but we can't. We can't have it both ways. You can't have, you know, you can't be lukewarm. You can't have your foot in both sides of the fence, so to speak, you know, walking the fence and living in the world half the time, living in Christ half the time. It doesn't work that way. Either you've given your life to the Lord, you trust him, or you don't. And that was one of the problems that, that Paul is dealing with here with the Corinthians. So verse 15 says, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. So in other words, he's just following on with his thought process from the previous verse that he's saying, well, if Christ wasn't raised, then we're misrepresenting God. We're, we're giving you a bunch of falseness. And basically, for all intents and purposes, then you shouldn't believe a thing we're saying. So he's saying, 
For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. That's the fundamental picture right there. If Christ has not been raised, then hey, why do we even have a church body? Why do we even have a church? You might as well just keep living the way you're living because, well, hey, there's no other option. Because that's basically what they're saying, is if Jesus hasn't been raised, then sin is pervasive, and you're just going to live in that anyway. There is no alternate solution to sin in life. I like the way the, uh, the uh, NASB puts it. Okay, go ahead. It puts it a little more strongly. Instead of futile, it says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. Yeah, if Meaning, Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still a total, in a total your waste, sins. A total waste of your time. Yeah. And, but, you know, it's sad how people can get locked into that, isn't it? Yeah. Because all of a sudden, you know, they just basically poo-poo that anything could, could be of that nature. And they put God aside. And they say it just isn't going to happen. It just doesn't fit within my scientific mind frame or whatever mind frame they have that they say it's just, that, that just doesn't happen. And then, guess what? You end up, you know, thinking that somehow you don't need to believe that. And then you got a problem. Then the issue is basically you've just pretty much said you're establishing your own fundamental way of believing and mm -hmm. if if it's a worldly way then that's fine then that's all you're going to get all you're going to get is a satisfaction from a worldly level and that's you're it put, you're putting your hope in yourself and that's I don't, it i don't even think about doing that <laughs> yeah. and you know that's what satan does though you know he tries to make things seem irrelevant especially to christians you know, because he wants you to live a defeated Christian life. He doesn't want you to live a victorious Christian life. And if you're not in the Bible, you don't know what it says, and you aren't living what God has revealed to you, Satan can pull you away. He can try to mess things up for you and make you believe different things that aren't worth believing. Because mm -hmm. that's what he does. He uses the world as his vehicle, you know, and he, he'll use God's word, too, to twist it in such a way to where he makes it sound, just like he said to Eve, right? Did God really say, did God really mean it? Did God, oh, come on, you know, I mean, don't be gullible like that. You know, it's that type of thing that Satan loves to throw out at people and to Christians. That's why we need to know God's word. Well, he did that with Jesus. If you're the son of God. Yeah. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> he knew we was. You're, you're, you're trying to pull this over on Jesus. You know he's the son of God. He knows he's the son of God. God knows he's his son. Why are you even wasting your time saying, if you're the son of God? Like, seriously? If, Je if Satan would do that to Jesus, think of what he would do to us. And we're not yeah. God, you know? But we can have God in us through the Holy Spirit. And we need to use the Holy Spirit to our advantage by studying the Word so that when Satan tries to throw that stuff at us and the Holy Spirit says, uh-uh, remember you read in the Bible where it says this. So, and then that's what you throw back at Satan, just like Jesus did. Jesus threw Scripture back at Satan, you know? Yeah. And so, so we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. And even those things that maybe don't fit into our logical way of thinking, we still have to look through supernatural eyes and accept it supernaturally because that's why we have the Holy Spirit in us. That the Holy Spirit's the one that gives us the fact that Jesus did what he said he did. And God did what he said he would carry out. And it did indeed happen. And we can take that to the bank just as if we were there witnessing it with our own eyes and seeing it directly. So that's where we stand because we trust him. And it's through his Holy Spirit that we are given that insight and that supernatural ability to say what God's word says is true. Not just what some of it says, but all of it, all of what God says is true. And as uh, Margaret had straightened me out, you know, uh, in, in Psalm 119, 160, it says the sum of God's word is truth. Right, Margaret? 
That's right. Amen. See you there. <laughs> so, and, and that's why I really like that verse because it doesn't say, well, just, you know, study uh, Acts or study Corinthians or study that. It says collectively the whole mm. sum of God's word is true. It's not. And that means it's not going to disagree because if there's disagreement, then that's confusion. But if it's truth, then there's agreement. So, and that's where we go. And I really love that, that verse. So he says, um, and I'll read 17 again. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, or as, as Andy put it from NASB, worthless, and you're still in your sins. And boy, that doesn't give us much hope, does it? If we were still to be living daily in our sins with no hope, he says, then those also, who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. In other words, those who have accepted Christ already and passed away, then they're done. They perish. There's no hope. There's nothing because there's no resurrection. There's nothing. Martin was bringing that out, right? There is nothing to look forward to in our death. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people are most to be pitied. So, so in other words, what he's saying is, if Christianity is just a ritualistic form of life that says I'm a Christian, but there's no substance to it here on this earth, then you're just running, I mean, it might as well be new age thing like Martin was talking about that, you know, Oprah was pushing. Uh, it's when you, you end up just living for what there is here on earth with no idea or even care about consequences after your death. You know, it's like whatever, you know, but they're not looking at it as if there is a hell either. In, in the new age uh, form of belief, do you think that any of them say there's a hell that you'll be going to when you die? No, of course not. Uh, that would not be an attractive thing to say, would it? Like, hey, b believe new age, because, hey, you're going to hell when you die. Come on, just join us to go to hell. You know, nobody living, wants to yeah. hear that. You're living for the now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You're just living for the now. Yeah, Mark. Uh, uh, that book that I'm reading about the second coming of, of, of the new age movement, yep. uh, that's exactly what I basically said. The, the same way that Satan tried to deceive uh, Christ, that's exactly what they do. According to the author, they twist uh, the word of God uh, to do their members. Yep. And uh, it gets this, this, the same lie. You know, that's so sad, too, because the, the thing is, is that the problem is, look at how many people believe it. They accept it like, yeah, that's good stuff. And, and yet all it's doing is leading them to eternal damnation. I mean, that's... Man, alive. I mean, bad. Bad is the word. <laughs> bad. I mean, There's sad. No yep. Yeah. And, and I mean, the thing is, is that they're just going blindly into perdition, into, you know, eternal destruction. It's like, man. Well, this, yeah, go ahead, Mark. You know where it is? That, look, I mean, I guess we are meant to follow people or to follow leaders. So if the person is very smart, was spoken, uh, he's leading these people. Well, these people there know the Bible. So wherever he quote our our context, they are gonna believe it because they're not gonna go and, and, and search in scripture because they're they not I'm sure those people don't read the Bible. So wherever he got that leader said, that's exactly what they're gonna believe. As you know how many cult even killed themselves just by following someone. Hmm? <laughs> exactly. And that is yeah that I mean good good example. You know, I mean, man, how many cults out there? How many people just blindly follow a person right to their deaths? I mean, physical deaths, let alone spiritual deaths. I mean, they were already spiritually dead, but, you know, it's, that, that's so sad. You know, I mean, there's just no hope in it. I mean, that should bother us a lot. I mean, we should be reaching out to people. Any chance we get where the Holy Spirit gives us insight and we're able to reach out to them and hopefully, that they will hear with their spiritual lives and their and, spiritual and I, ears. Yeah. I would say, say at the same time, we need to be thankful Amen. that God chose us and we know the truth. Because Amen. imagine, I could have been there. 
You could have been there. Amen. Right? Absolutely. But thank God we are not. Praise God. Amen to that. Because, man, I, I'll tell you what. I don't want to be one of these people most to be pitied. I am glad that I have a victorious walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that my hope is in Christ and that my hope is in the resurrection. It's coming. And I will be with him forever. Now, think about that. Think about if we walked off the, or jumped off the wagon and had decided to start believing something different. You know, that just wasn't what Christ had put out in the gospel as to what the gospel is all about. Think about, you know, where would we be? What, what good would that be to us, right? So, I mean, we've got the Holy Spirit to keep us on track. But think about those people that, you know, I mean, it's kind of like when Jesus talked about the parable of the sower, right? Some seed falls along the ground, Satan pulls away before the person even gets a chance to, you know, take it in. Some of that seed falls on rocky ground. People take it emotionally. It grows up. They think, yeah, I'm good to go. Yeah, I want some of this. But as soon as persecution comes, they're like, oh, forget that. I don't want none of that stuff. What about the thorn? You know, where the riches and the problems of this world choke out anything that you believe then they say yeah forget that that's too much of a problem to trust god through any of that stuff thistles, so, thistles. what's that yeah those are the thistles uh-huh the thorns and thistles so i mean those are the problems that you see in the world today a lot of them fall into those those three realm areas they've heard at some level but they've not really accepted you know and there's been no root there's been nothing to really get established in those people. And so they don't want to deal with anything that just doesn't feel nice and comfortable and wonderful every day of their life. And so, because nowhere in the Bible does it say when you come to Christ, everything is going to be peachy king. As a matter of fact, he talks about that. We're going to have to go through suffering. We're going to have to go through persecutions. We're going to have to go through some tough times if we really truly are following Christ. And we have to count the cost. And we have to count the cost. Amen. Amen. It, it, comes with, it comes with accepting Jesus Christ. Jesus said, hey, if they persecuted me, guess what? They're going to persecute you. If they hate me, guess what? They're going to hate you. You know? And it follows a suit that if they reject me, they're going to reject you. I mean, these are things that are going to be real. But they will be measure of the fact that you are Christ's. Because when they start rejecting you, they start persecuting you, they start, you know, treating you badly for his name's sake, then you know you're his. Because those are indicators that you, like Christ, are going through the same issues. And that's who we are to be, is we are to be like Christ. That means we have to be what, you know, what Christ experienced, we're going to experience as we follow Christ and grow in him. It doesn't mean we become, you know, defensive and argumentative and you know ready to go take out the world no we're still to love them we're still to reach out to them we're still you know to love our enemies as it were so and look at how jesus you know carried out his ministry do you ever see him fighting do you ever see him you know cursing somebody now he straightened out the pharisees very harshly but you know i mean there wasn't, I don't, it wasn't an unloving thing. It was something that he did to try to get them on track. Did they? Some did, not many, but some did. And some did so even secretly because they were afraid that they'd get kicked out if they claimed to be, you know, a follower of Jesus Christ. So, so I mean, there is a cost that comes with following Christ. And see, that was the problem here with Corinthians. They, they wanted to follow Christ, but they wanted to have it both ways. They wanted to say, well, I'll follow Christ, but, man, you know, I want to also be accepted by those in the world the way the world does it. So uh, it's no big deal to say there's no resurrection. You know, that's, that's kind of a pie in the sky thing. I'll just say that that's not real. See, see how easily the world can sway certain people and all of a sudden, then they just don't accept certain parts of the Bible because, well, it just doesn't fit into my lifestyle today. Well, that's not what Christ has called us to. But that's what Paul's trying to get them straightened out about here, isn't it? So he says, uh, I, I like that verse 19. If in Christ we have hope, in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So it's not about this life. 
It's about the fact that when we come into salvation, what, what do we become citizens of as soon as we accept Jesus Christ? Heaven. Amen. Our citizenship is not of here anymore. So why do we want to have, you know, this life to be the one that is the accomplishment? No, our accomplishment is when we get to go be with the Lord. We carry out the duties God gives us. You know, the works, Ephesians 2.10, he talks about the, re the works he prepared for us before time, right? And it kind of follows into what Donna was saying in Ephesians 1. I mean, God prepared all this stuff for us before we were even around. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's all in place for us. So look at verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Now here, that's a, a solid statement. He's not making this questionable. He's making it a fact. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He already proved earlier that there are witnesses, as Donna had indicating, that's, that was done in accordance with at least two or three witnesses. Well, look, he's a, he had over 500 witnesses that he's talking about, right? So he says, if in fact Christ has been, but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, what he's saying is that Jesus is the leader in our resurrection. He's already got his resurrected body, right? Those who have died in Christ after him don't have their new bodies yet, right? That doesn't happen till he comes back again. And then those who are dead in Christ will be raised and they will get their new bodies, right? And then those who are still around will be taken and meet him in the air and they will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. So then we'll have our new bodies. But those who die in Christ today, I mean, Paul put it clearly, absent from the body is present with the Lord. There is no paradise anymore like there used to be before Jesus died on the cross. That paradise has gone away. When Jesus died on the cross, he took all those that were in paradise into heaven because then his blood redeemed them. It was a looking forward through the system, you know, that God had put in place through the law. Those people were righteous, but they hadn't been saved yet because the blood of animals couldn't save anyone. But it was a looking forward to what Jesus did. His redemption then made them all clean and he took them into heaven because he paid the price for all their sin. It was a looking forward. For us, after Jesus, we are forgiven right away because Jesus paid the price already for us. We don't have to look forward to something that, because Jesus already did it for us. So that's what he's talking about. So for us, the first, Jesus was the first fruit. He's already got that resurrected body. Then all of us will have ours, those we who have fallen asleep, those who are dead. For as by man, for as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. So who is the man by which death came? Adam. Adam. That's right. The first Adam, right? It was Adam, Adam and Eve, Eve's husband, Adam. Yeah. Through him, when we sinned, and I say we because collectively that's who we came from. When we sin through him, spiritual death happened and physical death too, right? Now, back then they lived a lot longer, but they still died. They all died. And uh, so he says, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. And who is that man by whom the resurrection of the dead is come? Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Because he also came and he was a God man, right? He was totally man, yet totally God. And he lived on this earth as a man, just like you were, you and me. And what, what is it that he experienced? It says he experienced any and everything that any of us could ever experience here on earth. So he understands and he knows what we're going through. So, so he is the second Adam, as it were, and he is a man who has come also for resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, and so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But to be in Christ, guess what? You have to believe those three things he talked about that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. And so that's why he's bringing this out. He's saying, in Christ shall all be made alive. But it has to be by those fundamentals. You can't say, pick and choose and say, well, I'll believe that he died and was buried, but forget the resurrection part. 
without the resurrection part, there's no good news, okay? The good news is all of that put together, the death, burial, resurrection, and his ascension where he's sitting with the Father today, interceding, as Martin said a few weeks ago, that's what he does up there. He intercedes for us. Mm -hmm. He prays for us. He is our advocate to the Father for our situation. He's our great high priest. He is. And that's, and that's what we talked about the last couple of chapters. And Amen. that's what the high priest did in the Old Testament is that he made intercession for the sins of the people, Amen. At, which they atone for by sacrifices. Exactly. And now he does that directly. And that's why in First Peter, he talks about that we're a royal priesthood today, and we're the royal priesthood that goes to our high priest. See that? And that's why we have direct access to the Father through the high priest, because Jesus already paid the price for us, and the Father sees us as just as pure as his son, Jesus Christ, as he sees us through what Jesus did for us. That was God's plan from the beginning. And, man, it's a beautiful plan because it's hard for us to understand. It's kind of like, well, wait a minute. I just sinned a few minutes ago. Yet the Father sees me as pure as if I was as clean as Jesus in terms of my purity before him. Because, see, the Father can't see sin that way. In other words, I can't come before the Father as a sinner. So the only way he can see me then, he has to see me through the lens of what Jesus did for me by paying the price. That's why, you know, the, the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But then it's also why Jesus said, you know, it is finished. You know, we talked about that last week. It is finished because he paid the price already. It is the redemption price has been paid that fulfilled the Father's requirement for sin. And that's why we can go directly to the Father through Jesus Christ. And he sees us as pure, even if we just sin, because Jesus already paid the price. That's a hard concept to understand because, see, we... When we think about it our way, we try to think of it in a court kind of setting, right? And it's like, well, I'm not, I'm not proclaimed innocent till after I've gone through court and I've done all these things and a jury's determined me to be not guilty. And, but with Jesus, see, he already paid the price. So as, as we... He already went through the court. Jesus went through that court. That's right. He already did it for us. That's right. Not So we don't have to redo it because he already paid the price. That's why when the Father looks at us, those that are in Jesus Christ who have accepted him and make him Lord of our lives, when he looks at us, he sees us just as pure as Jesus is. That's a man. I, I just thank God for that because I, you know, I know myself and I know I always fall short. And it's like, or at least in my mind, I fall so short. But in God's mind, I lived up to it at the point where I said, Lord Jesus, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want to accept you as my Savior. And, you know, and my heart accepted him and put him on the throne of my heart. And I repented of my sin. And at that point, I became part of Christ's family, you know, God's family, because now I'm a co-heir with Jesus Christ, born with Romans 8. You know, and that's a hard concept because you say, well, how can I be of that level? You know, but it's, it's in, God already had that plan. And look that's at where we song. stand today. Praise God. That's song, how can it be? You know, that's, that's it. How can it be? I mean, <laughs> it's that, it's that question, isn't it? So we accept it because God's word said it. And we said, that's it. That's final. I accept it. Now that doesn't give us you know, license to go out and sin as we want. No, it, I mean, but that transformation he talks about in Romans 12 too is an ongoing process. It's a, a becoming more like Christ daily. It's not being conformed to this world anymore, but transformed, you know, to do what it is that God has planned for us in his perfect will. So, so when we look at that, Jesus was the first fruit for all who have died. And so we saw that, and Christ, the first fruit, then, uh, here he says in verse 23, but each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, now there's an order to think, then at, though, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. He's talking about his second coming here, 
So he's talking about Christ the first fruits, then at his coming of those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and authority and power. Now that's very end times when he's talking about that. Remember that ever, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus Christ. Remember that in, in Matthew 28 when it gets into the Great Commission just before that. When Jesus carries out everything that the Father had desired of the Son, the Father gave all authority in heaven and on earth to Jesus, right? But look what he does at the end. When Jesus, at the very end, after, we, after um, his coming, and we, we end up having our new bodies, we're with him in heaven, right? And the end, the final end come, when he delivers... He, at the end, delivers the kingdom back to the Father, right? After destroying every rule and every authority and power. When you go into Revelation, remember what it says? That at the very end, guess what? Where is Satan and the beast cast? Hades. That's right. They, they're cast into hell, the bottomless pit, right? I mean, into the lowest, the worst part of hell. That's the lake of fire. The lake of fire, yep. And so... When he's, he's cast there, what else is cast into hell along with him? Death and hell. Death. That's right. Because remember. And hell. That's right. And hell. Remember where death came from? Death came from the first sin, didn't it? I mean, the very first sin brought death into the world. Death is like an entity. Because notice that he casts death, that entity, and hell, which is separation from God and a terrible place with gnashing of teeth and fire. It, hey, believe me, it's not a place, you know, those people that say, I, I need to go to hell because that's where all my friends are going to be. Hey, there are no friends in hell. I guarantee you. There is no such thing as relationship in hell to where you can say, yeah, man, it's going to be fun. It's party all the time. Baloney, you know, get, get out of that mindset because it's not going to be like that at all. It's going to be a, a, terrible place you can't party in a blast furnace no and i'll tell you what it there will be no happiness no hmm, and it's forever you know and i mean think about how many of these religions out there and there are some christian denominations out there that say well you know hell is only for a while like oh it's only you know depending on how bad you were you may have to stay a little longer than others but after you've gotten your whooping you know, then God will take you back in and you'll be fine. And hey, baloney folks, don't don't buy into any of that. But Oscar what's that? Oscar Meyer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. There, there was a past, I think, that came out, uh, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, that said that he doesn't believe in hell anymore. So he's, he's another apostate. Yeah. <laughs> Apost but doesn't the Bible say that's what's going to happen at the end? Apostasy, it will increase? Yes. And, and who, like, that? who was that, Martin? I, don't, I can't recall his name, though. But he came out. Uh, it was a big pastor with a big church around here somewhere. That he doesn't believe in God. The Pope is saying it. The Pope is saying it. Oh, man. Well, the, the, well, uh, it, that, that one surprised me. Yeah. The Pope ran <laughs> off the track. The Pope ran off the track centuries ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think he ever was on the track. <laughs> it's, uh, it's he put it back in the ditch. He put it back in the the whole time. Yeah, it's, it's sad. I mean, because I mean, you'd be surprised all the things that are going on out there. But don't be surprised. The Bible says it's going to happen. So yeah. don't, you know, I mean, when it comes, it just gives veracity to God's word. Is it says, right. see, I told right. you it's coming. Yes. So, I mean, be ready. Keep your eyes open. Walk close mm -hmm. to the Lord. And Keep be, your legs trim. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, let's look. Um, but look at what he says. Um, then comes the end. He delivers the kingdom of God. He, he gives it back to the Father, okay? For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, right? Satan. Uh, the beast, uh, death, um, hell, 
all of those are actually enemies, okay? Because that goes back in Ephesians chapter 6 where it talks about principalities and powers in the unseen realm. And it's, it's bigger than what we deal with, okay? But it's something that's always happening in the spiritual realm right now. Yes. And he says, but the last enemy to be destroyed, as Don had mentioned, is death, right? That's an enemy. It's not, it's not part of what God has in his plan. And all of this started, or at least to our knowledge, it started back in the angelic realm, didn't it? When Satan decided he was going to do his own thing, and mm -hmm. he was going to be like the Most High and ascend to the throne and take over, Ooh. basically. Yeah, and look how quick Jesus said he got cast out, like lightning. Yeah. <laughs> like a bolt of lightning, yep. So, <laughs> and I saw him fall like lightning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty quick. Pretty quick. So, I mean, what we see is that Satan is still using that, his, his, you know, ability, because God's given him a certain amount of flexibility and ability to rule over this earth. And it all happened back when he was able to tempt Eve and Adam ate of the fruit. Basically, by eating of the fruit, the God allowed, Satan took on a certain amount of power that God allowed. And that's when he became the prince of the power of the air. And that's why we're dealing with his antics even today. And hey, and Satan seems to be getting more subtle in his approaches, and that's how he drags people away. Because people start saying, Well, yeah, that, that sounds pretty right, you know, because they don't know their Bibles, they just automatically assume what they hear is right. Yeah, the Bible says my people um, are destroyed for lack of knowledge of my word. And because you reject my word, Amen. I will reject you. And, and that's where it comes to. You know, so, I mean, we need to know God's word. I keep saying that because, I mean, it's important. We need to know it so that Satan can't try to bamboozle us and do the Eve thing to us. You know what I mean? Hey, we've got enough problems to deal with. We don't need to be, <laughs> we don't need to be eating the fruit we're not supposed to be eating. In other words, sin, right? So look at verse 27. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when, it's, but when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When mm -hmm. all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. And that's where we come back to where we know that Jesus is the one that was put, everything was put in subjection under him. That goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15, where, you know, it says that, you know, uh, and the snake, basically that Jesus is going to bruise the head of the snake and that, you know, that the snake then will bruise his heel. So, in other words, the cross, that was pointing all the way to the cross, even in that prophetic utterance, you know, because yes, did Jesus die on the cross? That was the bruising of the son's heel, as it were. But then what happened is that by Jesus dying, though, he took power away from Satan. That was the bruising of Satan's head. Now when Satan he resurrected, had when he, resurrected, when he resurrected, that's when he killed his head. That's right. right. Because at his resurrection, he completed what God had sent him to do. And guess what? Sin was taken away from Satan. Satan had sin up to that point. But now Jesus has the power over sin. What's that? I'm sorry. I, don't, I shouldn't be interrupting. No, I that's fine. No, just the dying part um, is, is amazing. But the fact, the thing that sets it apart is the resurrection. Because it's what we just got through saying. Without the resurrection... It's, it doesn't mean anything that he died and if he didn't raise from the dead because that's what, that's what um, broke the curse of sin and death and hell and all that stuff. That's what overcame it. Was Amen. The Amen. And that's the point Paul's trying to bring out here is that you can't, you can't have it, you know, your way and God's way. It's either God's way or the wrong way. It's as simple as that. And that's what he's trying to bring here. And that's why Jesus is saying, hey, everything was put into subjection to him. 
after he had resurrected, God put everything. That's why he's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. He is God's power side, right? Isn't that what right hand symbolizes? That he is the power of God in all things. He represents God in all things. And so he is his power. And so that's what he's saying. Everything is subjection under him, right? And so all things are subject to him. Then the son himself will also be subjected to him who puts all things in subjection under him at the end, basically, that God may be all in all. Now, a lot of times we tend to look at this and say, well, wait a minute. Why does God, who is God, who is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, why do we break those things apart? Because, it, you know, whether it's under the Son or under the Father, it's still under God. Because, hey, God the Son is still God. God the Father is still God. God the Holy Spirit is still God. So why do we bring out these differentiations? Well, that, those are some of the mysteries of the Godhead. Each has their role, but Jesus, you can see, clearly submits to the Father in the Godhead. He always exalts the Father, doesn't he? He always does what the Father's will is. And the Holy Spirit basically does what the Father and the Son have him do. And so we see that even though we see that differentiation, they, it, is, it is still God. He is still God doing it all in all. And in the end, God's going to carry out his master plan, whether it's through the Father, through the Son, or through the Holy Spirit, God's plan will be carried out. Mm -hmm. And we are in him. And that's the beauty of it. And I think that's where we need to keep our focus. Keep our focus on the Lord and follow him. And in the end, guess what? We are with him. And God the Father wills it, what Donna says. That's right. It's all about the Father's will. As a matter of fact, what's the Father's will for you and me today? What does it say in uh, Romans 8? What's the will? What does he have? He has a will for us today. Not necessarily to go get crucified. But his will is that we be conformed to the image of his Son. So, see, his will is that we get to look more and more like Christ, mm -hmm. you know, here on this world. Now, he sees us as Christ-like through the lens of Christ because he sees us through what Jesus already paid for us. But in terms of what others see of us here on this earth, we should look more like Christ to the people that are around us, you know. And in other words, we should be looking just like what Jesus looked like while he was here on this earth reaching out to others, loving others, caring for others, being there for others, you know, being there for our brothers and sisters, upholding one another. You know, I mean, when you look at those factors that we see in scripture, I mean, we've got a pretty large role and none of it says be mad at each other, hate each other, um, you know, go beat each other up or go gossip about each other or speak bad about somebody. No, he says to love each other, right? Mm. And I'll tell you, that's not an easy thing to do, but he says that if we can love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love each other, love our neighbor as ourselves, we've done everything that the scriptures talk about that is required from God for us to be his children. So it is all fundamentally in an ability to love. Oh, if we could love like God loves. Hey, we'd be, we'd be golden. But the reality is, how well are we doing in loving everybody and others and never having an evil thought towards somebody else? It's like the song says, but God re God remembers that we are but dust. <laughs> That's where you we know? fall and, out, isn't it? And that we are but flesh. That's it. Because we're we weak in dirt. and of ourselves. We're weak. What's that, Donald? You don't expect very much from dirt, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Good point. It just flowers? turns into mud if you put too much water on it. What's that, Victor? Flower, flowers and plants, grass, vegetables. Yeah, there you go. Produce <laughs> fruit, right? <Yep. laughs> so, Frank, yeah. Frank Sinatra was wrong when he says, I did it my way. There is nothing in us of any value. That's really what it comes down to. You know, it's only through what God does in and through us that has value. And we surrender to that. That's where we need to be. We need to give up self and look to him. 
And that's where God fulfills his all in all. It's, he's, he fulfills it through us and through his Holy Spirit, as Donna put on there on the text. So, I mean, let's keep looking to the Lord and let's keep our focus on him and on the fundamentals, okay? Don't let the world distract us from those fundamentals. Let's stay focused on him all the time. Hey, it, I, like I said, there is so much out of Corinthians that we can just bring into our world today, and it fits. If Paul was talking to the church today, it would be just as apropos today to the church today as it was to the Corinthian church back then, because we have these problems in our churches today. They may not all be focused on just the resurrection, but the resurrection is crucial, as we said. If Christ didn't resurrect, then we are most to be pitied, because then we have nothing any better than any other religion that's out there that speaks to some leader, spiritual leader. You see the issue? But it's in the resurrection that we see that God displayed his supernatural power and that he was able to bring himself to earth and then he was he is now alive seated with the father even though he experienced death because he had to experience the death because that was the sacrificial offering without his death there would have been without the uh, what how's it how's hebrews put it without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin basically right so he had to die he had to shed his blood for us to have hope today. But that alone was not enough. In his resurrection, now he set as the first fruits of what his all his church is to be, those that are going to follow him. We will have a whole new, a whole new life with him for eternity with our new bodies. Because he's the first fruits, we're to follow. What so he, yeah, go hey. ahead, Victor. What does he say when one gets angry at himself and cusses himself out for something that he's done? I mean, what, what he says is, you need to look to me and trust me. Because remember, a part, part of what you're saying, Victor, is that we're demeaning ourselves in the process. You know, <laughs> we're falling short. And yes, we all fall short, right? That's what the Bible says. We all fall short of the kingdom of God. But what he... Because we are in him, what he wants us to do is he wants us to trust him. He wants us to cast all our cares on him because he cares for us. And he's not doesn't want us to be worried about any of those things. He wants us to keep our eyes on him, trust him to guide us through any of those difficult situations like Isaiah 43, 1 through 3 talk about. That he goes through the waters with us, we won't be drowned. He goes through the fires with us, we won't be burned up. Because we go through, he goes through them with us and protects us. We go through them, we still got to go through them, but he protects us as he goes through them with us. You probably know what I'm talking about from our earlier discussion. You're running over everything with your lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> I put in my water filter today, and I, I'm pulling it out, and it's full of water. All of a sudden, it trips, and all the water in the filter is all over the floor. Oh, man. Oh, boy, was I <laughs> cussing and swearing at myself today. <laughs> I forgive you, brother. Okay, you're absolved. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this, did you have something, Andy? Yeah, this says it best. Uh, this is out of uh, Psalm 103. Oh, I love it. Uh, Count all his uh, benefits. I love that. Yeah. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Amen. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our iniquities. Amen. For as high as, or he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame, and he is mindful that we are but dust. Amen. I and love I, that. I like the verse that, the verse that comes before it. He says, and consider all his benefits or count all his benefits. I think it's verse two, um, because what those are his benefits is the fact that he doesn't 
count all these issues against us and he understands us, he knows us, he knows our weaknesses and our problem. And the benefits are what he shows mercy toward and, and in, in terms of his love, his everlasting love towards us. Yeah, I, I love that psalm. That was one of my mom's favorite psalms too. Yeah. The east and West principle, uh, I was told the other day, if you traveled east on the earth and kept going east and east, going east, 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 east. You never get to the West, right? You never get to the West. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I always wondered um, when, they're, when they're calling everybody up to meet Christ in the air and it gives the order, where does the, the dead wait or where, where are they until they're called up with Jesus? Where, wherever they ended up when they died, uh, some will, some today, some are buried, some are in their caskets, you know, in their, uh, at, at a cemetery plot. But think about it. There are some people that, are, I mean, look how many people today are cremated. And right. yet God still has control over everything that that person is, even in cremation. What about somebody that's gotten eaten by a shark out at sea? You know, think about how scattered that person is at this point. Um, or blown up in a war. Or, or blown up in a war. God still has every, I, I guess, atom of that person identified in the way that he can put that person back together when his time comes, that resurrection. I mean, I think that's, I think, Mary, that's a beautiful picture of the fact that nothing is lost from God's sight at any given time not even atoms, you know, I mean, everything is still in his control. And it, it reminds me when he says that he has every star in heaven named and he knows them by name, how many trillions and trillions of stars are out there? You know, I mean, to, to God, you know, these types of things that to man seem like, how in the world can God keep track of that to where he can put us back together and give us this new body? You know, for those who are dead, you know, when who knows where they're at or how scattered they are throughout the earth, yet God can do that. And I think that's, I think that just speaks to God's omniscience and omnipotence, you know, in where, terms. Where, is there, face, where does the spirits wait? Oh, the spirits go to be with the Lord. That's what Paul okay. talks about, is that absent from the body, present with the Lord. When, the present with the Lord is your spirit goes to be with the Lord, okay, okay. until the body matches up. Now, and, and I mean, some people say, well, what, what does a spirit look like? Does it look like a toothpick up in heaven or, you know, that's waiting for the body and then the toothpick goes back into the body? No, actually, uh, apparently people are, people are, can be, remember when uh, Jesus was talking about that Abraham rejoiced? to see that I, you know, when I came to do what I did when he was talking to the Pharisees and they, they claim, well, even in our spiritual being, we're, we're definable and viewable and understandable by others around us and we're known by others. So apparently the way I've heard it put by some is that we have a temporary body, if you want to call it a body, up there because we all still know each other but we don't have our final body until god's sec or jesus is second come. well if you'll remember in one of the gospels when jesus was walking on water and he was coming up to the boat uh the they thought he was a ghost yeah. The, the, yeah they thought he was a ghost mm -hmm. and and a ghost of course is a spirit right right and and so there is so, apparently some form to a spirit because they they saw him, and and they, and they recognized it as a spirit until they right. saw really who it was. Right. Amen. Why would God have to look for our earthly body when when uh, we ascend into heaven? He gives us a new body. Uh, don't ask me. I guess that's one of those mysteries that you say if we've already got a form. <laughs> before God in heaven, because absent from the body present with the Lord and were known as we have been known is what it, the Bible puts it. But apparently it's, it's what Paul's talking about here in terms of the first fruits. Whatever happened to Jesus, everyone that comes into Jesus will have that same type of being. And that's our eternal, that, in other words, 
right now, those that go into heaven don't have their full eternal construct yet. But once, once Jesus' second coming comes, in other words, at the end, then we will all be as we are meant to be for all eternity. And, you know, I mean, some of those things are still mysteries to us. Why is it different? Mm -hmm. Why, why are we this way at this point and need to be that way at that point? I don't know, Mary. Those are some, those are some things that are mysteries to us right now. And the Bible doesn't fully give us explanation. It just tells us that that's what's going to happen. And so we just kind of accept that by faith and say, okay, then if that's what's going to happen, so be it. Well, we'll Ted, find out when we get there. Yeah, yeah, Dave. Or Doug, I'm sorry. Dave, uh, i got to get going. I've got to take my blood sugar test right now. Okay. Uh, I would like you to say prayer for Gail. She was real sick last week. Okay. And we're under, we're under quarantine. Okay. And then, of course, the grandkids and my daughter. You got it, brother. All right? Yeah, uh, we'll definitely be praying for them. Okay. Hey, we'll and, see and, and feel better, my brother. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Um, yeah, Can give our love to Gail. Uh, he's gone. Anyway. So, so, Mary, does that answer your questions then? As best we can answer them? <laughs> yes, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So, what's that? Oh, okay. Uh, I think Jean was talking. Forward to her new body. <laughs> oh, hey, I think we all are, to be honest with you. I mean, not that, you know, in heaven, we're going to care, like, what we look like. Yeah. I mean, not in terms of how we are on this earth, where we say, oh, man, I want to look really buff and, you know, <laughs> have this great hairdo and all that. I mean, I don't think in heaven it's going to matter. I think what's going to matter is that we are with him. Amen. And and I mean, it, because vanity won't be there. Vanity is a sin. So, yeah. and I mean, all of those things that make you want to look a certain way or have people perceive you a certain way is vanity. And that, that'll be gone. You know, that's not going to be an issue up in heaven. So whatever God has planned, it will be awesome. I can tell you that beyond a shadow of doubt. That will be wonderful. Awesome. Amen. To cure, that to cure that problem, we should all look alike. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't think that there will be problems, regardless of what, you know. I mean, I just think it's going to be awesome. Yeah. No more sorrow, no more tears, no more pain. I mean. No more does this dress make me look fat? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Does this shirt does this shirt make me look like I got a big belly? Come on, man. Anyway. <laughs> Those are human issues, aren't they? Yep. Yeah. But uh okay, any final questions, comments, agreements, disagreements about what we have? Because we'll be picking up in verse 29 um next week. And uh we're gonna keep talking about this because obviously this was an important issue to uh, Paul, um, and so he, he takes quite a bit of time talking about it, but I think it's good for us to talk about it because it's real, it's here today. We're dealing with these same type of issues here today in the church, and we need to be aware of it so that when we have, when we get these kind of issues presented to us, we can take them on and say, well, that's not the love of Christ that way. You know, it got, Christ, Jesus didn't come that way to the earth. Jesus did indeed do these things. And he's got a plan and a purpose through why he did what he did and how he did what he did. And through that, we can have hope and salvation in him and basically go to live with him for all eternity in heaven where there is no more sorrow, no more pain, no more problems. Hallelujah. Amen, amen to that, brother. I do have a comment because I've always heard about my, you know, my hope is in Jesus. I've always okay. heard that, but until we had this conversation, it didn't hit me how without Jesus, there's total hopelessness. Amen. That's right. I mean, it, uh, Jesus is the hope. I mean, it was God's plan. It's like, you know, Donna had mentioned earlier, it was a plan that God had before time. And the reality is, I mean, God doesn't wish that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, but not everybody is. I mean, God has 
And the God knows those who are going to come to him and come to know him. Uh, and I mean, that's our job to be out there telling everybody so that those that are going to come will come and will hear the good news and they can, you know, make their decision to follow Christ. Mm -hmm. Just like we have, you know, Martin was talking about that earlier about, you know, God has selected us. He knew us. And here we are today because he's loved us. And we saw that through Jesus Christ. Amen. Or we see it in Jesus Christ, not saw it. I mean, we're experiencing yeah. it today, that hope as you were talking about, Jim. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, okay. Any other prayer items then? I've got the ones, you know, about Gail and, uh, and Doug, because they're dealing with quarantine. Because it's out there. Oh, we'll, oh, we'll be praying for uh, Aaron, because they're on the road. He and Liz are on the road traveling, so we want to make sure that they have safety. And I, I just want to put a general prayer in for Sherry, because I know she deals a lot with family issues and, and you know, things that are difficult for her to understand and deal with in her life. And that God will just give her peace as she he keeps her, her eyes on him. Okay, well then, let's pray. It, it, it's a great lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for helping us to see and understand more of your wonder and the fact that you have loved us so much that you would even send yourself through Jesus Christ to be the propitiation for our sin, to die on a cross. What a terrible thing, you know, in terms of how we see it from our eyes, but yet it was the only way for us to be able to be forgiven our sin and to be able to receive your free gift of salvation. Oh man, I, we can't even begin to thank you enough for all that you've done through Jesus Christ and through his death, burial, and resurrection and the fact that he is sitting with you at the right hand interceding for each and every one of your children, Heavenly Father. Amen. So. We thank you for that, and we praise you for it. And let us not minimize it, Lord, but keep our eyes on you and become more like Jesus daily through the guidance of your Holy Spirit in and through us. Now, Lord, I pray for Gail and, and Doug as they're under quarantine, but I know Gail's still dealing with, you know, some malady and feeling bad. Please, Lord, put your healing hand on both Doug and Gail so that they will come out of that and be healthy and be with us again, Lord Jesus, I pray. I also pray for their grandkids. Uh, I, I pray for their children first, you know, or their daughter, that you would be with her and also with their grandkids, Lord. Keep them safe because I know they, they live in a hot spot area. Well, I think all of Orange County is a hot spot now, but Lord, just keep them safe and, and continue to provide work for her daughter, Lord. Well, I pray for Aaron and Liz as they're on the road and traveling. Keep them safe, Lord, and, and I pray that they would, you know, have a good time, you know, doing what it is that they're out doing, and that you would give them opportunity to be able to show your love to others, I pray. Also pray for Sherry and her family, Lord, that you would continue to be with them. Give Sherry peace as she's dealing with these issues in her family, and just let her know that you're always near, and she doesn't have to worry that she can trust you in and through these and that she can cast all her cares on you. And that's what we pray, Lord, is that you would just accept those items and take them on and help her to be able to see that you've got them and that she doesn't need to worry. Now, I pray for all of us, Lord, as we deal with the issues that are going on around us in this new normal, as it were, that you would be there for us in all things, that we would keep our eyes on you and trust you mm -hmm. in and through everything, Lord. Now, I also pray for our leaders. I know that this, this election time is, is getting pretty nasty out there. Lord, please help us to show love for one another more than antagonism and, and the desire to, you know, I guess just put people down as we think we're a better candidate, so we've got to minimize the other person. Oh, that's not right, Lord. So, Lord, just give us direction and guidance. Give, give wisdom and understanding to our leaders so that they can make the right decisions. 
And when the elections do come, Lord, that the right people would be put in place that, mm-hmm. that would be open to listening to you and leading based on your guidance, because there is no better way than to follow your way. Lord. Now, Lord, I pray that you be with us and keep us safe and let us keep our eyes on you and trust you in and through it all. And thank you for all you've done for us. We praise you, we honor you, we give you all the honor and the glory and love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Oh, I guess I'm still sharing out on it. There we go. So, yeah, I think. Amen. Amen. So let's keep our eyes on the Lord, my folks. Yeah. Praise God. Keep your lamps lit. Amen. It's a crazy world out there. (laughs) It is. It is different. Lamp. Yeah. Amen. (laughs) It's getting crazier every day. Yeah. 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 Good oh, reason to keep our eyes on him. What's that, Victor? You know the latest on Pastor David? I haven't heard anything, but as far as I'm understanding, he's doing fine. I mean, he's recovering on track, is my understanding. And so, because I remember when I said six weeks, that's been four weeks ago. So, Pastor, I just talked to the Pastor Jimmy Monday night. Uh huh. And Pastor Jimmy said he he expects that probably in the next few weeks, uh, Pastor David will start coming. Yeah. Start making a show. Part, yeah. yeah, partial days. Yeah. Part days and working. That's about what I figured because I thought we were down to about two weeks now from that six week period that they had talked about. So that sounds about right. Two weeks, three weeks now. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, that's good. That means he's on track to good recovery. So praise God for that. Yep. Amen. Amen. All right. Dad, okay. Thank you. You got it, Martin. God bless you, my brother. Take it easy, Martin. All right, Andy. Take care. Good night, everybody. Good night, night, everybody. Good night, Andy. Blessings. Good night. Good night. Good night, Donna. You're welcome. Good night, Jean. And Mary, I guess Jean took off. What's that, Donna? I really appreciate your faithfulness in doing this. Well, praise God. I'm kind of, you know, locked into it, right? And I don't have much of an excuse to say no way, but uh, no, you're you're welcome. You're welcome, Donna. Praise God. You have a gift, and we appreciate you sharing it with us. So. Well, I, I just praise God that we can come together and all of us are able to, you know, speak to these issues because, I mean, that's how we learn best is when we all engage. And, mm-hmm. you know, because some people don't speak, but, you know, most of the time I find that it's just about if you have a question in the when we're discussing, you'll find that others have it. So a lot of times, if you don't bring it up, then the other person doesn't get answered, a person that normally doesn't, you know, engage. But as we bring up issues and topics, you find, we, you know, other people's questions are answered. I think that's the power of the Holy Spirit that does it. Amen. 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 Good night, well, thank Hey, you good so night, much. Marco. How are you and Laura doing okay? Yeah, we're, we're okay. Thank God. Thank you oh. for your prayers. Everything is going fine. Well, Thank praise you. the Lord, my brother and my sister. Yeah, you guys have you. a great evening. Oh, okay, good okay. night. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah. Good night. God bless you. Bye-bye. Good night, Margaret. You take care of my sister. Okay. We'll see and you Saturday. Saturday. You got it. Saturday it is. And we'll continue in Hebrews then, okay? Yes. Okay. God bless you. Bye. Good night. Okay. Bye-bye.